I heard running and I didn't want to look back and then from that point I just felt him put his arm around my throat and I was screaming and he got me on the floor. I was just trying to fight him off and he kept punching me in the head, telling me to shut up, but he was holding his mouth. Then he was trying to undo my trousers and he was holding me throat. I felt like I couldn't get out of the way. He's out there and he, he, could do it to, he could do it again. Anybody who's seen someone with scratches on his face, they should make that call because he's, he's going to do it again. <sighs> Clearly, he's, he's going to do it again. When I linked this third offence, I knew that I was going back to 2014. And so making sure that the public were reassured um, was of paramount importance really for me. I'd been to the media back in December 2016 on the anniversary just to see if I could jog anybody's memory. We'd been national with Crime Watch and I felt initially that I'd saturated that media. But it, it's just been relentless and pursuant in terms of what that goal is. And that goal is we have to catch the person that's responsible for this. And if we have to go back five times, 10 times, 15 times, we will keep coming back we will keep going with those lines of inquiry until such a time that we identify the person that's responsible for this. With three attacks now being linked, the urgency with which detectives were treating the manhunt was renewed, and the senior officers knew that they needed to turn once again to the public for help in catching him. That meant telling the people of Derbyshire that the man responsible for these three horrific attacks was still out there. My thoughts on, on, on the morning of doing the appeals was, uh, w was really mixed because um, I knew there was going to be the scare factor, I knew people were going to be frightened by it, um, I knew that it may affect the person responsible. There was always the, the chance that actually it would spur him on to do something else. Um, that was a big fear for me to be honest and, and trying to balance the way um, the appeal was led was really important to me. I wanted everything to go into it because it was a it was it was a massive chance. It had to work for me. It had to work. We didn't want um, the person to strike again. We didn't want the victims not to get that um, you know the conclusion for them that we caught the person responsible. The plan of action was to launch a massive media campaign, one of the biggest the force had executed in years, combining local and national media the force's own presence on Facebook and Twitter, and a hugely increased number of officers on the streets. The idea was to keep the artist's impression at the forefront of people's minds. Everywhere they turned, officers wanted to see that appeal. I've obviously got 20 odd years service. I have never been involved in a media appeal uh, in that scale at all, and I've certainly not um, led one. Um, it was everywhere. Um, you know, and, and to get BBC ran it three times with different lines, and, and I hear that they only normally run the story once. You know, ITV, um, the radio, the Telegraph, the local local news were fantastic. You know, they kept that message going. It, it was vital that we kept this very much at the forefront of people's minds, and so having an effective media campaign that essentially hit social media, it hit the radio. It went through the television, it went through the newspapers, there were police officers out on the street, we were targeting addresses with leaflets. Um, was really, really important because that intimate knowledge within those locations of where that offender had been, for me, led me to believe him to be a local man, as I've previously said. I think when we talk about victims within, um, when we're doing an appeal, we've got to be conscious of the impact on them. And I know a lot of work was done and preparation. They they knew what was you know what was going to be put out. But even on that day, them hearing it again, them hearing my voice, telling their telling their uh, their story, whether on the radio, you know, the news in the newspaper, the impact w was always going to be big. And and what we wanted to do was for them to understand why we were why we were doing it in this way and what the opportunity hopefully would bring for them. And I can't underestimate how hard it would be to ring us and tell us that name of the person if you suspected somebody. But my heartfelt appeal to you today is, my heartfelt appeal is, please give us a ring. We need to catch the person responsible. If it's a family member, if it's a neighbour, if it's a friend, a work colleague, give us the name. It was this tactic of sharing the image widely and keeping it as prominent as possible that led to a critical breakthrough. 
Whilst in Spondon, obviously I'd been in the village, there were shoppers passing by and I was handing them the leaflets, again there to jog the memory, ask them if they recognised the fit that we'd done. There was a lot of engagement with the community uh, there. There was a couple in the background that seemed a little bit nervous, so I approached them and asked them if I could help them. Was they happy to receive the leaflet that I got? And that was that crucial piece of information. They said they wanted to talk to the police and we went and spoke in private. They handed me some details which I immediately passed on to the incident room. They was very cautious about handing the information on, more worried about reprisals than anything. But it was just a matter of retrieving that information, getting those vital pieces um, that would be the link we needed. They were still unsure in terms of, because they weren't 100% positive because it was a sketch that it, it was the person that they thought it was. And so it took them a, a while to deliberate and reconcile with themselves that they needed to pass that name forward to the police. And of course, what we do know is at the point that they passed that name forward, and it was one of a, approximately 50 names that were passed forward as part of this wider campaign, um, we were able to take that, process that, go out, request a DNA sample, and we subsequently learned that the person that had struggled with that do I, don't I, actually held that golden piece of the jigsaw that meant that we were able to finish this inquiry and we were able to bring some closure for those victims. And in March 2017, two and a half years after the first attack and following several media campaigns, thousands of leaflet drops, hundreds of statements and dozens of DNA swabs across Derby, the net finally closed in on the suspect. With nowhere left to turn, he gave himself up. Right, well, I'm here to confess to three crimes, two sexual assaults and one rape. 